Uh, John, in in uh, the United States, uh, we see Waymo is the the big player in the robo taxi industry, and we see some other, you know, maybe a couple of other major players. But in China, it seems like the industry is much much bigger. There's a lot more players uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, beginning to commercialize. Is is that the case? Uh, yeah, I definitely say it's a lot more competitive. I think in the US, it's clear to say that Waymo is dominant. Uh, Waymo actually can operate a robo taxi without a human supervising the vehicle, whereas you can't necessarily say the same for like Tesla's robo taxi. If you've seen that, and in terms of scale, it far exceeds like um, the other, like Zooks, for example, or Cruise, which exited but might be coming back soon if the speculations are correct. Whereas in China, you can say that the clear market leader is is Baidu Apollo. I think they have a, a fleet size of over a thousand vehicles, but there's plenty of other players operating in major cities like Wuhan and Shanghai, for example. So we have like WeRide, uh, Pony AI, uh, smaller ones, smaller companies would be some things like QCraft, who I believe have collaborated, and Momenta, who worked with SAIC, which is a major Chinese OEM as well. Uh, this is just a an a few examples of what's a really competitive or robo taxi environment in China. My understanding is that in a couple of cities like Wuhan, that we're starting to see completely driverless um, uh, robo taxis. Uh, is that the case? Yes. Yeah. So uh, originally, with all these robo taxis, you have the issue of you want a human operator in the vehicle, and that's that was the case for all of them at the beginning. Uh, but yes, especially in this case now, you're, we're having a, a much higher number of humanless operate, where the human is not operating the vehicle inside the car, which I guess reduces costs and could potentially increase your part, uh, make your path to profitability easier. And now we're looking a lot more at things with vehicles which are more remotely operated, and this remote operator can operate over, they can observe multiple vehicles at the same time. So is that when you say um, an operator, do you mean someone who's monitoring the operation of the of the robo taxis to make sure that they're you know not malfunctioning or having a problem? Yes. Yeah. So in that case, um, for uh, in the case of you can one human monitor can monitor, for example, twenty to thirty vehicles, and if there are examples where you obviously get flashed up. You can monitor the, the progress of a vehicle overall. Or if a passenger has any concerns, then they can, for example, press a button and then they can speak to the operator and the operator can help them get something sorted out. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a massive step in favor of what we used to have, which was you had to have a human. And as is the case still in a lot of environments, you had to have that human present there in, to override the vehicle immediately because the risk was so high. One of the things that strikes me about the robo taxi experience in China is just how many miles uh, it's it's already logged. Uh, Baidu's uh, Apollo Go, for example, millions and millions of rides, uh, fourteen a million over over since it got started, and two point two million rides just in one uh, quarter, and that seems extraordinary and far far more advanced than the uh, United States. Yeah, I think to counter that, I think Waymo also has, no, I don't have the numbers to hand, but is definitely competitive with Baidu's Apollo Go in terms of the fleet size, rides over time. But in both cases, they, it's just the number of miles driven per quarter increases exponentially quarter on quarter. Uh, and I think in the advantage that China has is that it's not just Baidu, Apollo, but for example, I believe we ride also have a fleet of 500 vehicles, Pony AR aiming to get a thousand vehicles by the end of the year. And these will inevitably contribute to much higher uh, miles driven over higher operational areas as well in terms of square miles or square kilometers. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'm, I'm curious about, because there's been a lot of debate about whether robo taxis will add to or subtract from traffic in, you know, these really congested big cities. Um, what's your take on that? Um, I think the, the way I see it is, and you, we mentioned, I think earlier at some point, mobility as a service where with it, it seems like it's quite far in the future, but. I imagine it's going to come at us quite fast where it's going to be less of there's humans in general, us are going to be less incentivized 
to own a vehicle. And I feel like that's so shocking because I feel my parents are so attached to their vehicles and it's such a different era. But in that case, one robo taxi could serve potentially hundreds of people over the course of a day. And with reduced private vehicle ownership, um, I can only imagine that eventually you're going to have reduced congestion and equally, I'd say that's beneficial in terms of pollution as well. Uh, just having fewer vehicles on the road, fewer, but yeah, less congestion, less traffic. I definitely would lean towards this being beneficial. Uh, one of the features of uh, of China, uh, China's robo taxi industry, is that there are a number of legacy automakers. Now, uh, in, over in North America, we think of that as you know GM, Ford, Toyota, Honda, and so on. But we're really yeah. talking here about Chinese OEMs, aren't we? And why are they getting into this uh, in into this industry? Um. I think it sort of goes hand in hand. Uh, I guess the first thing is in terms of vehicle technology, you could definitely make the argument that legacy OEMs haven't been able to keep up with Chinese OEMs in terms of how agile and flexible they are in terms of their development. And yeah, like especially in the case of where we're transitioning now to electric vehicles, I think the legacy OEMs have just been a bit slower in that transition. Scott, I want to talk about the um, the number of uh, startups here, yes, because it's sure. not just about uh, robo taxis replacing the kind of regular taxis that we're talking about. There's all kinds of niches, uh, you know, shuttles and and what have you, yes. that that the bigger companies are maybe not interested. Um, so how how big is that is that sector and is it growing? Uh, yeah, definitely in the case of, I mean, autonomous vehicles come under loads of different things. We could have things like autonomous construction ve vehicles, but on roads, you have things like robo shuttles, robo buses, and autonomous trucks as well. And these all, like you say, serve different niches. Um, and the market is big enough that these com all these companies can sort of choose a niche and work into it. So, for example, robo shuttles. I'm a big advocate for public transport, so I personally think robo shuttles are a great idea. And I think they're not only great in China, but they're going to be great across the world in terms of being able to take you from point A to point B, where this is a commonly taken journey throughout. So like from airports or from, I can't really think of any other examples right now, but where there's going to be a lot of repetitive journeys and you, know, so you have these shuttles and buses which can do that. Uh, in China, it's just a lot more friendly to have these and companies which have made a robo taxi have can also apply that technology usually with only a few changes to to operate as for example a shuttle or a bus are we starting to see the emergence of specially made vehicles for robo taxis and the reason i ask is because my impression is that in north america in the united states you know they're using regular evs that have been you know uh, adapted to autonomous yes. driving but it, it's always struck me that that's kind of a waste of space. I mean, you've got a big, you know, you a fairly large vehicle with one person in it, whereas you could, you know, if you were making custom, e, uh, custom EVs just for autonomous driving uh, and for one person, you'd make it much smaller. Uh, what's your take? Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a really interesting one. And I think this contributes as to why it's sort of quite a difficult business to sustain right now because... For example, Waymo, most of Waymo's on the road right now are Jaguars and they cost a lot of money already. And then you have to add all these expensive sensors on top. And you could argue it's maybe not the best way to do it, but at, the mo at this moment in time where I guess they're not focusing primarily on pr uh, profitability and uh, their next generation vehicles are actually from a Chinese OEM, Geely, and they're significantly cheaper. So. The concept of building an autonomous vehicle from the ground up, like you say, apart from the sort of research and development phase in terms of manufacturing and in terms of efficiency, it's going to be a lot faster. Um, this is We are seeing that in the US as well. Uh, if you've seen like Zoox's RoboTaxi, it doesn't, it doesn't have, you know, waste space on things which humans would need, but we but won't need because it's a RoboTaxi. And it can, for example, it's a bit more compact. It can drive both forwards and backwards. 
In China, at the moment, from what I'm seeing from robo taxis, is that they're still based on EV related platforms, and I think that still makes sense at this point because uh, you can mass produce these vehicles, and in China, we know that you can mass produce them at much lower cost. And in terms of advanced driver assistance systems on private vehicles, we are essentially upgrading the software and hardware on these vehicles to to do that. Uh, but looking further into the into the future, it will be the case, I believe, that autonomous vehicles will be made from the ground up as a robo taxi to begin with. But that's not something I'm seeing particularly at the moment. Well, John, uh, it's fascinating talking about the rise of this industry. Um, so thank you very much for this. Thank you.